Sunday night, we're in the book of Revelation. We've spent a long time on this book. It's been every Sunday night for over a year, somewhere about 60, 65 weeks. I'm not sure how many, and I need to go back and count them. And we're trying to wind up. We've gone through the book, and I always have to put the word Revelation on the board every week. The word Revelation is a common word to us. We think of the apocalypse when we think of Revelation, because Revelation is comes from that word apocalypse. It is the Greek word A-P-O-K-A-L-U-P-S-I-S, apocalypsis, and that word apocalypsis means to reveal something. In fact, the word reveal, it comes from the word revealed, apocalypto. And apocalypto uh, is, comes from apo, meaning off with, off with, and calypto is the word cover. It means off with the cover. And so, and the way that God is revealing the book of Revelation to us, he's taking the cover off by using pictures, signs, and symbols. That's what the first verse of the book says. Uh, the first verse of the book says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. Now, you see what it says there? Uh, this revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto uh, him to show unto his servants things God's given un unto Jesus so he can show his servants, you and I, and John, particularly at this time, things which must shortly come to pass. Not 2,000 years in the future. And John wrote this book around 96 A.D. Some people think he wrote it about 65 when Nero was king, but I don't believe that. I'm not going to go into that right now. I believe he wrote it around 95. So shortly come to pass means immediately after John has the vision, it means he's going to show things that will come to pass shortly as, a, as concerns the time period of the writing of the book. So it's not just about things at the end of time. It certainly is. It's got the end of time in this, but it's got the time period of the church from John's time all the way to the end of time. And this is a revelation of Christ to God's elect Gentile church over this last 2,000-year period. Now, in that last, the last phrase of that sentence, and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Now, what God did, he signified it by the angel to John. What is the angel doing? He's signifying, S-E-M-E-I-O-O, semi-I-O. <coughs> and of course, that word comes from semion. That's the common Greek word for sign. The, the Jews seek after a sign. That's the same word, a sign. It means a flag, a signal, a beacon. So what he is saying, God is, going, God is going to give the angel signs, flags, signals. A flag points to something. When you're driving along the road and you see a man standing in the road and he has a little orange flag, what does that mean? Huh? Well, it has the idea of slowing down, paying attention, because it means there's some kind of road work, something in the road, something's going on there. Slow down and wait until you're given permission to go. Uh, 
That's what a flag is. It's a signal. So all of the pictures, all of these metaphors in the book, these are pictures. They are flags. They're not literal. They are spiritual. It's just like when you see the scorpions. The scorpion in Revelation 9 is the word scorpios. Well, the scorpion is a signal Scorpios. It's a signal as to what is going on. First of all, when you're reading Revelation, always go take your concordance, go back to the Old Testament, and find out if you can find, look and see if you can find scorpions in the Old Testament. Well, you're going to find several uh, things two particular in the Old Testament called scorpions. First of all, you're going to find in Ezekiel, the second chapter. Ezekiel, the second chapter. Let's look at this. I haven't, I've quoted it, but let's look at Ezekiel, the second chapter. Ezekiel, the second chapter. Now, these guys like Hal Lindsey and Jack Van Impey, and Jim Baker's saying it now that scor- these scorpions sound like helicopters to them. That is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. When you go back to Ezekiel, the second chapter, Ezekiel will tell you, I keep saying, you're going to get your answers for Revelation out of the Old Testament. Don't we keep saying that? That's where you're going to get th- the answers for Revelation. Ezekiel, the second chapter... And he's talking about Israel being a rebellious house. And look here in verse 5. And they, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are a rebellious house, yet shall know that there has been a prophet among them. And thou, son of man, be not afraid of them, neither be afraid of their words, though briars and thorns be with thee, and thou doest wet, thou dost dwell among scorpions, be not afraid of the words of the scorpions. That's what it's saying, isn't it? Nor be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. He's saying that when Israel was carried into captivity, when southern Judah was carried into captivity, he was saying to Ezekiel, you're going to be living not just among the Babylonians, but a bunch of rebellious Israelites in Babylon, false teachers, worshippers of Baal, false teachers, tree worshippers, He says they are scorpions. Be not afraid of their words. Kyle Jones, a friend of mine, said he was talking to an heir about it. uh, He was taking some uh, Arab language out at Vanderbilt, and he called me one day, and he said, this Arab, I asked him what, what they called a con man or a tricky person when he spoke. He said, the thing that came out of his mouth, he said, we call them scorpions. And that is an idiom or a saying over in Israel. Then you've got one other thing that is called scorpions. That was the whip that uh, when Rehoboam, king of southern Judah, Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of southern Judah, when God decided to split the kingdom because Solomon allowed his 700 wives and 300 concubines to keep their idols, and they led Solomon's heart away, God said, I'm going to take the kingdom from you, Solomon. And he split the kingdom when Rehoboam took some bad advice from some of his teenage friends who said, you tell when the old men came to Rehoboam when he ascended the throne, and they said, uh, they said, why don't you be a little easier 
on us. Your father chastised us with whips. And Rehoboam said, let me consult some of my high school buddies. He got some of his teenage friends in, and they said, you tell them you're the king of Israel. You tell them not to tell you what to do. You tell them that your father chastised them with whips, and you'll chastise them with scorpions. Well, he didn't mean he's going to put a bunch of scorpions on them. A scorpion was also a name for a little short whip. It was the predecessor to the Roman flagellum over here that they beat Jesus with and that criminals were beaten with. This little whip, it was called a scorpion because it had <coughs> several <coughs> little <coughs> leather whips on it and they had pieces of glass and bone in that and that was a predecessor to the Roman flagellum it would come down on somebody's back and would just rip the hide out and when they whipped them with it with that little short whip cut down to the bone and exposed the flesh in the bone that's another name for scorpion well scorpions in the ninth chapter of Revelation Scorpions are evil teachers. Go back over the ninth chapter. Let me just show you a couple things here. <clears throat> I haven't really finished this, and I didn't intend. I didn't intend to get into it. If I can find something here. Hold on. Looking for something. All right, look here at uh, Revelation 9. And I'm trying to show you what a flag is or a beacon. What is a beacon? It's a signal. We think of a beacon usually as out on a uh, some little jetty in an in a uh, setting out a little island out barely in the ocean and the beacon is to keep it's a warning signal to keep ships from coming up up on the rocks and that beacon is going round and round like that so the ships can see that there is a bunch of rocks here and they don't want the ships coming in and going aground because of the rocks there well <clears throat> look here in in Revelation, what I'm trying to show you is what are, what are beacons and signals? What are these signs? A beacon would be, I keep saying this, if you see, if you see a, a, a crossbar like this and you've got all these red lights here, and you've got a... a this track coin here. And you got this bar coming out here. When that bar is down, when these lights are flashing, and you got a bell on here going ding, 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 that is a flag. It's a beacon. What is it saying? That's not just a pretty little decorative thing. They stick on a highway. So you say, oh, isn't that pretty? Listen to that bell sounding. That's not just so you can see something pretty. And you don't judge. You don't judge what's, what's going to. It's, it's, it's a signal for a train coming. You don't just look at that and say, boy, that's pretty. And keep driving, do you? It's danger. It's what it is. And that's what the book of Revelation is doing. The scorpions of Revelation 9, they are a beacon. It is a picture. It's an idiom. It's evil men. Look here, Revelation 9. The fifth angel sounded. These are seven angels that have seven trumpets. And the seven angels are the seven spirits of the seven churches. And the seven candlesticks are the seven churches. So this is the refined church sounding out. The word seven means to be refined. This is the refined church sounding these things out. 
He says, when the seventh angel sounded, I saw a star fall from heaven. If it was a literal star falling from heaven, that wouldn't be a sign, would it? That would be the real thing. A sign indicates something that's there that could happen or that's going to happen. Doesn't it? That's what a sign is for. A sign points to a happening. If this was a literal star, it wouldn't be a sign, would it? No. It's a sign. When the Bible says the stars of heaven fall to earth at the end of time, this is what it's talking about. When you see the third angel sound in verse 10 of chapter 8, there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp. Well, the stars falling from heaven have to do with the angels, the refined message of God being sounded throughout the world by the preachers of God. And I saw a star fall from heaven, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit, and he opened the bottomless pit. Now, bottomless pit, remember? If, we, if it was actually a bottomless pit, a pit with no bottom, even if it was a lake, a real deep abyss, dark, and, and we think of an abyss as something dark and eerie and ominous, something we can't understand. That's what we think of as an abyss. If you, if you went off into a, a fog-covered jungle marsh, that would be a type of an abyss. Or if you went to some great drop-off into some real dark ocean and there was no light coming in, you would consider that an abyss. Well, that's not what this word means. If you were plunging off into something literally like that, it wouldn't be a sign. It would be the very thing. Do you understand what I'm saying? Signs point to the thing that you're, that, that you're uh, trying to emphasize. A sign points. <clears throat> These events and characters and creatures, that's not the, that's not the sign. Well, they are the signs, but the real thing is what they're pointing to. The signs itself is not the real thing. The real problem is not this flashing thing dinging uh, with this track here. That's not the problem. The problem down here is this locomotive headed your way. If you could just have, if you could have this right here and decorate your living room with it and have four or five of them there and have it go off. Uh, you don't have a problem with this. The problem out on the highway is a locomotive is coming. And if you hit your car, you're going to die. So a flag, a beacon, points to the real thing. The sign points. We see pointing signs all the time. It'll say, out on the highway. And it'll say truck stop. That truck stop. Or it'll say eat. I've been on the highway. And we're always looking for something that says eat. Hey, there's a restaurant. It says eat. We know there's food there. It's pointing towards food. I'm not interested in the sign. I'm interested in the food over here in this restaurant that the sign is pointing to. So we have to find out what are these signs. And the fifth angel sounded, verse 1, and I saw a star fall from heaven. Remember the seven angels in, in chapter 1? The seven angels, Jesus has seven stars in his right hand, doesn't he? He has seven stars in his right hand. Then the Bible explains the stars in the last verse. It says the seven stars are the seven angels with that have the seven trumpets over here in 8, 9, and 10. Right? 
So when the stars of heaven fall to earth, you got seven trumpets, seven angels, seven stars in the right hand of Christ. And the seven stars are the seven messengers, the word angel, angelos, A-G-G-E-L-O-S. Messengers. The stars falling from, from heaven to the earth is the seven stars in the right hand of Christ, isn't it? That's the angels or the refined church sounding the trumpets. And the trumpets in Revelation 4 and the first chapter of Revelation are voices. So this is the voice of the refined church. The stars falling to heaven is when we as the trumpet, we trumpet the word of God with our voices. We are the candlesticks refined. And the stars falling to earth is the word of God coming and hitting the people. That's what it is. That's the signal or the sign. Well, if you go back to uh, Revelation 4, go back to Revelation 4. Uh, verse 1. This I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as, as it were a trumpet talking with me. If you'll notice, a trumpet is a voice talking, isn't it? Huh? And then he says in the first chapter, first chapter, verse 10, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. The trumpets are voices, aren't they? The seven angels Seven is the number of refinement, is the refined church, and the stars of heaven falling to earth is the message of God coming from our mouths, falling upon the people of the world. Let me show you one other thing about trumpets and voices. Go back to 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter. I'm not going to cover this whole chapter. I'm just going to give you... A little bit here. First Corinthians fourteen. Let me look at my other Bible here. First Corinthians fourteen, just to show you voices. All right. Paul is talking about The glossa or the tongues they were speaking at Corinth. Then he says in verse 6. Now brethren if I come unto you speaking with tongues. And the word is not Pentecostal tongues. It's the word glossa meaning foreign language. We know that, that the seaport city of Corinth. <coughs> uh, the seaport city of Corinth was a place where they had just myriads of tongues, many, many, many different foreign languages. Uh, this was a seaport city where all the sailors of the world met and all these travelers. It was the hub of the world during its heyday at this time. And what shall I profit you except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine? And notice how that God compares the tongue and even things without life-giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds. How shall it be known what is piped or harped? Now, as the trumpets of God, we are trumpeting a particular thing. We're trumpeting the judgment of God on the vessels of wrath, and we're trumpeting mercy upon the vessels of mercy which God hath before prepared to glory. And if a trumpet give an uncertain sound, I did a tape called Tongues, a voice with an uncertain sound. Trumpets have a purpose. When you hear a trumpet, uh, when you hear reveille, reveille is when you get up 
when they blow reverently in the morning, about six o'clock in the army, you have to go out and you have to muster and you have to uh, meet formation and answer. But you wouldn't, the trumpet is nothing but a signal. The trumpet is not the gathering in itself. It's a signal that says, go and gather outside your barracks. That's what it's saying, isn't it, Jerry? It's speaking to you. And when you have taps, that's it lights out when it's time to go to bed. And you have various things the trumpet will do. When you hear that uh, sound that they make, they sound the trumpet when they're going uh, up at uh, the Kentucky Derby. That means horses get to the gates. It has a particular sound. And that's what he's saying. If the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to battle? So likewise ye, except ye utter by the tongue words to be easily understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. And what he's saying, our voices have a particular purpose just as tongues, just as the trumpets of Revelation 9. Let's go back over there. So trumpets are voices. <clears throat> Y'all forgive me tonight. I'm really having a hard time. I'm not, it's not hurting. It's just hard getting it out. There. All right. Now, go back over here to chapter 9. Given a key to the bottomless pit. Of course, bottomless pit. If bottomless pit actually meant a bottomless pit, it's not a sign, is it? A sign is something that you use to indicate something else, isn't it? You understand? Is there an English term for that? Just a metaphor, yeah. Now, bottom's pit, of course, is the word abusos. And it comes from bathos. And when you, that word means something with great knowledge or intellectual depth. Placing the alpha primitive, the first letter of the Greek alphabet, in front of a word negates the word, gives an opposite meaning. That word abathos translates abusos, and it means a place of no knowledge. Well, the scorpions, the false teachers, have no knowledge, and they come out of a place of no knowledge. When a man preaches false doctrine, he is saying wrong information, preaching false doctrine, and he has no knowledge. Whenever I say these preachers out here don't know what they're talking about, that's because I've spent years and years, 48 years studying. And I can tell you when a preacher knows what he's talking about. If you've been coming here six months, even four, three or four months, and you're paying close attention, you're beginning to hear preachers lie, aren't you? You begin to hear it. No, you're just thinking, no, that's not true. You were intimidated before you come here. But at Grace and Truth Ministries, we, we give you the permission to call liars, liars. We say it's okay to call them liars. That's what they are. And that's, I believe that what we do here is we encourage people by verifying what they've already suspected, that something's wrong out there in the world. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> and he opened the place of no knowledge, and there rose a smoke out of the pit. Now, what Hal Lindsey tells you, this is a great big hole in the ground. And what he sees is helicopters flying up, and they come up out of the pit, and somebody has blown up a big nuclear warhead and smoke is coming up out of it. Oh, God, help me. <laughs> I, where can I bang my head on something? <laughs> oh, get away from me. As the smoke of a great furnace. What is it that false teachers do? 
Well, they scattered the flock, scattered. Uh, they cloud the issues. They cloud. That's a good word. They cloud. It's misty. It's smoky. It's hazy. Scatter is the verb form of scorpion, scorpidzo. And Jesus said the hireling careth not for the sheep. He allows the wolf to come in and scatter the flock. Well, when, the, when Jesus said in Luke 18, He that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Well, that's the word scorpidzo, the verb form of scorpion. If you don't gather with Christ, the opposite of gathering together, and when I think, think of gather together, I don't mean going to a Baptist church or a church of Christ. That's what I'm talking about. Gathering together with the only fellowship that God allows us to gather together. Remember the word gather together is soon ago. S-U-N. A-G-O. Ego means to lead. Soon means to gather. It means to lead together. Soon means, soon means fellowship. We're only allowed to fellowship with his suffering. If you're not fellowshipping with Christ, you're putting your approval on false teachers. If you don't gather together with people who believe in suffering for Christ, believe in predestination, believe that Christmas is pagan, believe in a daily cross and death to self, you're helping the false teachers to scatter the flock. The opposite of being a scorpion is gathering together or fellowshipping in the fellowship of his suffering. You don't have to be a scorpion to contribute to their cause. You just don't gather together with God. That's what he said. He opened the bottom spit and there came a smoke. I'm thinking of something. The false teachers, like Jerry said, they cloud the issues, don't they? This is very interesting because look at, 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy, the 6th chapter. Here's the smoke of the pit. You're talking about false teachers. 1 Timothy 6, verse, now Timothy and Titus. Timothy and Titus are two young preachers. Their books First and second, Timothy and Titus. Timothy and Titus. These books, uh, among the scholars, they have, they have an official title. Just like you would call Matthew, Mark, Mark and Luke, these are the synoptic. Gospels. They have a synonymous view on the miracles and on the things that happened. First and Second Timothy are called pastoral epistles. That's because Titus is the pastor of the church at Crete. Timothy is the pastor of the church at Ephesus. And instruction concerning how to pastor and how to be aware of false teaching is found in these epistles. So when he's talking here in the 6th chapter, in the 6th chapter he is saying, Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. False teachers blaspheme doctrine, don't they? Scorpions blaspheme. Blasphemos. B-L-A-S-P-H-E-M-O-S. It comes from blapto, B-L-A-P-T-O, and in P-H-E-M-E. Blapto means to hinder. And feme is our word fame. It comes from the word P-H-E-M-I. 
That means a word spoken. So we hinder the word of God as it is spoken. We try to stop it. That's what blaspheme means. I was raised in a preacher's home, and I heard preachers say all my life, well, we just don't know what blaspheming is. It means to if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, you hinder the Holy Spirit. And what is the Holy Spirit? The truth. You hinder the truth. If you hinder the truth, you don't believe the truth, and you won't be forgiven for that. You have to believe the truth. Then he says, And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved. He's not talking about the masters of this world. He said, we're talking about the pastor in the church, even your boss that may be a believer if he was one, that don't despise him. They're faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. Then he says, If any man teach otherwise than the doctrine of Christ, otherwise is the word hetero. Let me erase some of this. H-E-T-E-R-O-D-I-D-A-S-K-A-L-E-O. It comes from hetero, H-E-T-E-R-O. That means other. And didaskalia, D-I-D-A-S-K-A-L-I-A. That is the word doctrine or instruction. If anyone comes preaching any other doctrine or instruction, we know we're not to bid them God's speed, according to Second John 10. We know to, we're to avoid them in Romans 16, 17. And I'm getting to the smoke. If the smoke is literal, it points to nothing but smoke, doesn't it? The event itself doesn't point to anything. Uh... If you're looking at the moon through a, through a telescope, the moon's not pointing to anything. The telescope is. The telescope is the sign. The moon's sitting there. What we're looking for is the subject. We're not looking for the signs, but the signs point us there. The Simeon. And God said he'll send his angels to John and point to the truth with the signs. I believe that's where everybody misses Revelation is in the very first verse. God said, I'll send signs, Simeon, flag signals to point to the real thing, the spiritual. He says, if anyone preaches otherwise, who would preach otherwise? False teachers, scorpions, wouldn't they? Even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's homologeo, isn't it, that we talked about this morning, the keeping of the contract. And to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he's blowing smoke. He is proud, it says. There is the smoke coming out of the place of no knowledge where the false teachers are. The word proud denotes the smoke. The word proud is the word tufao. And it means to be slowly consumed by smoke with no fire. When you have embers go out in a fireplace... They have no fire. The false teachers don't have any fire, do they? They have no fiery trials. They have no fire in their mouths. Remember we talked about the fire from the mouth of the prophets? What happens 
when you've got a log on the fireplace and the fire goes out? Starts smoking, doesn't it? It's kind of like a false exhibition of what's going on. There's no fire. It's out. But the, the log wants to say, well, look, I'm still here. Well, you have no fire. So, and it comes from the word T-U-P-H-L-O-S. The word proud comes from this word tuflos. That word tuflos is the common Greek word in the New Testament. Blind. So the smoke blinds. <clears throat> when you're seeing a proud preacher in the pulpit, he is blinding the eyes of the congregation by the smoke that he's blowing, by his pride. Isn't he? That's what he's doing. He's proud. He knows nothing. Doting about questions and strifes of words. Whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men, of corrupt minds. Their minds are corrupt. You remember the word corrupt? P-H. T-H-E-I-R-O. Fathero. And that word fathero means ruined. And the word mind is the word N-O-U-S. And that word means understanding or thinking. Their thinking is ruined. That's the false teachers. Then he says, they are destitute... Of the truth. The scorpions are destitute. So when you see the smoke of Revelation 9 coming out of the place of no knowledge, that's these false teachers that Paul is warning Timothy, this young preacher, to look out for because they're going to come with, like smoke with no fire and blocking the light is what they're going to do. Well, let's go back over to Revelation 9. <clears throat> smoke, uh, he opened the bottom of the pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit. The smoke is not the real thing. The smoke is the pride of the scorpions, the false teachers, coming out of the pit as of a smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened. That's very interesting. By reason of the smoke of the pit. Now what he does here. When he's talking about signals and signs. He is pointing. At the literal. He is making comparison. He's making a comparison between locusts and scorpions. Now, locust. Let's read that next verse, and I'm going to show you this. We're looking at the difference between the, the very thing, and you might call the simeon, you might call that a shadow, couldn't you? The shadow was the ritual of the Old Testament, or the literal, and that pointed to the spiritual in the new. A temple over here, now we're the temple of God. Circumcision over here, our hearts are circumcised. We're all written on tables of stone. We're all written on fleshy tables of the heart. This is the same thing as the rituals... The rituals were signals and signs and flags pointing to the real thing. Now, where was I? Well, I'm going to read the next verse. And there came out of the earth locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power 
as the scorpions of the earth have power. He's comparing locusts with false teachers, isn't he? Or with scorpions, right? I'm going through this real slow so you can see this. He's comparing locusts with scorpions or false teachers. Now, why did Israel go after Baal in the grove? Why did they do that? Because they were taught to go after them, these idol gods, by the priests of Israel. The priests of Israel were false teachers, weren't they? They went after him, and God said, if you go after other gods, what did he say he was going to do? That's right. Four judgments, four judgments. One, sword, famine, two, pestilence. Four, beast. And the beast was Babylon, the lion, Persia, and the Medes, one empire, two horns, Media, the bear, Greece, the leopard, and Rome. That was a composite of these three, and it was the iron beast that broke in pieces. Remember, Rome was iron. Now, what's the first judgment that God brought, usually? Y'all remember? The famine was the first one he always brought. And he'd do this in several ways. What were some of the ways he would do this? No rain for three and a half years under Elijah. No rain. What other way? Boy, he'd do that. He'd send locusts. We're not talking about what we call a locust, a Katie did. We're talking about this and small, but something like this. That and small. Some of the writers said that they were up to six and eight inches long. This is a small one there. That's about three inches. But they've got some that are quite large. And that they could go into a field and just devastate the field in just 25 minutes. They could take a tree. I've got a picture in one of my books of a tree before the locust hit it, just full and lush and green. Fifteen minutes later, it looks like dead of winter, and there's not a leaf anywhere. And that's how quick they work. And when the locusts were coming, the people panicked. They just went just nearly berserking out of their minds because they said, there goes our crops, we'll starve. And they would get real frustrated. Have you ever, I've seen a movie here a while back where the farmer, they got real, the locusts were coming. And when they were coming, I don't know how they got this picture in these fields and these crops, but man, they were millions of them. And this woman was out there crying and, and trying to kill them. They were stomping them, and you couldn't. There's no way. There's hundreds of millions of them the way they would come. What do the locusts destroy? Locusts destroy. What do they destroy? Huh? Crops. Particularly, they would destroy the bread crop. They would des destroy the fruit. The fruit crops... Now, what would the 
spiritual locusts destroy? What do the false teachers destroy? They destroy the word of God, of God, spiritual locusts, which is scorpions, false teachers. They destroy the word of God, which is the spiritual bread, isn't it? It's the bread of Deuteronomy 8, Matthew, the fourth chapter, Luke, the fourth chapter, and Amos, the eighth chapter. Let's look at Amos one more time. Amos, the eighth chapter. Amos 8. Amos 8, verse 11. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will send a famine in the land. Not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea, from north even to east, they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord and shall not find it. In that day shall the fair virgins and young men faint for thirst. Why is there going to be a famine here, not of bread, but of the word of God? When would this be? It's definitely going to be in the end of time. Certainly Israel had periods of time where there was no word going on in Israel. And that's because the scorpions were preaching it, preaching a false doctrine, and they were clouding with this smoke. Huh? Look back at verse 2. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. The sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. The writers tell us, the writers tell us, here's a, here's a field with crops in the first century. Here's a field. When the locusts came in, they would be millions of them. And it would become nearly pitch black. They would stretch out for 25 to 30 miles. Hundreds of millions of locusts. Here's the sun up here shining. But you couldn't see the sun because of the locusts. You were in darkness. If you were standing down here in this wheat field... You were in darkness. That's exactly what the false teachers do. According to that second verse, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. The smoke is a, like a picture of all of these scorpions or these locusts coming, and it's dark. And the sun is blocked from coming through. And the false teachers, they are these locusts, this darkness. And they block, block the light from coming through. That's exactly what the false teachers do. This is allegorical picture to show you false teachers. Don't you listen to Jim Baker. He gets on TV lately and saying. Sounds like helicopters to me, and that's all they got. They at the end of their sentence. <clears throat> and it was commanded unto them, unto who? The locust. Not the locust, but the scorpions. It was commanded unto the false teachers that they hurt, that they not hurt the grass of the earth. What is he saying there? 
They hurt not the grass, neither any green thing, neither any tree. He's giving you, he's giving you the signal here. He's saying, the spiritual locust, I'm not sending them to destroy grass and field and green things. They're going to destroy something besides that. They're going to destroy the word of God. That's what he's saying. He gives you the signals here. Doesn't he? But only those men that have not the seal of God in their foreheads. The only people that false teachers can affect. And we see that we're sealed in the previous chapter in chapter 7. In verse 4 of chapter 7, and I heard the number of them that were sealed, and there was sealed in hundred and forty and four thousand of the tribes of the children of Israel. We've already preached on the hundred and forty four thousand, these being the first fruits out of chapter fourteen. And to be sealed in the forehead, what did that mean? Huh? Back in back in the days of Old Testament Israel, the masters would seal their servants in their foreheads or in their hand. And this comes out of Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter. Let's go back there one more time. Deuteronomy 6. I don't think I've gone through this this slow. Is this easier to understand me talking this slow? Huh? Or y'all already know all this? Huh? Y'all hadn't heard it? Okay. And the only reason I'm going slow is I've got laryngitis. Y'all, I'm sorry, but next week when I get excited again, I'll be going rippity rip. So pray for pray for laryngitis. Yeah, I can't slow myself down. So many things to say. Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and all thy soul and all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day... <clears throat> shall be in thine heart. God said, I'm going to write them on fleshy tables of the heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontless between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. And that's where the Jews get the, uh, I forget the name of it, the mezuzah. The mezuzah they put up on the right door of the house, and they got that from here. And they put certain verses, this being one of them, in the mezuzah. It went on the right door. I've got one a Jew gave me one time when I sold him a house, and I put it on the left door facing going out my front door, just in case you want to look at it. It's just a decoration. And they also put them between their eyes. Well, what was that? When they put it between their eyes, what did they do? Phylactery. The little black boxes, they tied it around their head. And they put the phylactery on their left arm because they said it was nearest the heart. That's what the Pharisees did. And in that, those black boxes, they had these verses. Put it, that's not what God's talking about. To put before the eyes was to seal in the forehead. It meant to put in the mind. It was an old ancient saying. To seal upon the hand meant to where you worked and what you did. Have the word of God involved in your work. It, 
it has it goes along with first Timothy the second chapter where the Bible speaks of lifting up holy hands. That doesn't mean to raise your hands in the air and go oh, 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 oh. that doesn't mean that. Holy hands comes from the heart. The Bible says God is not worshipped with men's hands. Fleshly hands are not holy. It's talking about lifting hands up to go to do the work of God. Like it says here, put them up on your hand, where you go, where you lie down, where you rise up. That's the sealing of God's servant. God puts it, writes it in our minds, not some little mark of the beast. When you have the mark of the beast on your forehead, the beast is Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. It's a Babylonian system of let us make us a name of going after self. The mark of the beast began in the garden, didn't it? Mark of the beast, the serpent's more subtle. The serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. The serpent was the beast in the garden. He ruled in the garden. Babylon ruled in the world. And when the serpent was more subtle, God said, do not go to the middle of the garden and go after that tree in the midst of the garden. Don't go after that tree. When you go beyond the boundary of God and you go outside of God's boundary, that is the word H-A-R-M-A-R-T-I-A, harmatia. And it's the word sin. It means to miss the mark or the boundary. And, of course, the mark of the beast and to be sealed the word mark is the word karagma, C-H-A-R-A-G-M-A. And it comes from karax. Karax means a stake on a boundary line. God's got a boundary. It is his law. He said, here's my law. Eat of these trees here. Don't eat of the tree in the midst of the garden. And when you go beyond the boundary, God's boundary is horizo. Prohorizo, of course, is the word predestinate. It means to prebound. Did God prebound Adam and Eve? Yes. So the mark of the beast is back here. And having a mark on our foreheads doesn't mean a literal mark. Doesn't mean a computer chip. It's talking about having God's law written in our mind. And having it on our hands where we rise up to go to do the work of God... Holy hands comes from the heart. You don't raise your hands in the air and they're holy. Now, let's go back over here. All of this is pictures. Can you see its flags and signals? And it was commanded unto these false teachers that they don't do the same thing the true locusts do. A real locust hurts green things. These are scorpions or false teachers. False teachers don't go out here and try to strip a tree. He's giving you the signal here when he says don't hurt any green things. He's saying, when he says this, this is not literal locusts. This is spiritual locusts. It's scorpions. It's false teachers. But only those men which have not the law of God, or God's seal, in their minds. You can't go take the mark of the beast by having us. I, we got some people that have come here, one fellow that comes here from time to time, and he's afraid that when the tribulation comes, somebody's going to force him to take the mark of the beast, and he's going to have to go to hell. The mark of the beast is going beyond the boundary line and eating of the tree. And what's in the tree? All that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's what you partake of when you partake of the mark of the beast. You go beyond God's boundary. And you become unlawful. And that's the word anomia. 
the mystery of iniquity. You remember the word nomos? Nomos is the word law in the Greek. It means legal food. Did God legalize certain food in the garden? Yes, he said you can eat of every tree of the garden except this one in the center of the garden. Stay away from it. That's in the beast. That's in the serpent. That's his boundary. So when you go beyond the boundary of God... You cross the stake, you miss the mark, that is sin. You get involved in unlawfulness, place the alpha in front of nomos. It translates A-N-O-M-I-A. It means unlawful food. That begin here, that's the mark of the beast. And when we won't take the mark of the beast... When you take the mark of the beast, you go beyond the boundary. And John said, all that is in the world, all in the world, the lust of the flesh, flesh, lust of the eye, pride of life. Eve looked at the tree. Eve looked at the tree inside the mark of the beast. The serpent is more subtle than the beast of the field. I'm going to repeat this. Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome, the lion, the bear, and the leopard, that was the beast all through the scriptures in Daniel 7, Hosea 13, Revelation 13. And the beast distributes the fortunes of the world to the individual, doesn't he? This is what he distributes, all that's in the world. Eve saw a tree that was good for food, lust of the flesh. A tree that was pleasant to the eye, to eye, lust of the eye, the pride of life. She saw a tree that make her wise. She could be proud of herself. This is what you receive when you receive the mark of the beast. When you don't receive the mark of the beast and you go after the law of God, which is his word, then you upset people. They don't want to work with you. We have people here the same. The more I get into truth, I've heard guys say here, well, gosh, if we preach the way we should, we'd lose our jobs all the time. Probably would, wouldn't we? What would happen then if we lost our jobs? You'd have a hard time buying and selling, wouldn't you? That's what the Bible says in the 13th chapter of Revelation about those who receive the mark of the beast. They have a hard time buying and selling because they can't work with these people. They don't like our message. They hate us. The mark of the beast has been here since the garden. The men who take the mark of the beast are going after the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It don't have anything to do with computer chips. That is the stupidest doctrine in the world. It's always been here. What gets me is the Bible says that the beast was like a bear, a lion, and a leopard in Revelation 13 and 2. And the Bible speaks of this beast, Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome, and Daniel 7 being a lion, a bear, and a leopard. Well, if the beast is here in Daniel 7, if you got a mark of the beast in Daniel thir in Revelation 13, I guess you'd have a mark or an authority. The word mark is the word karagma. It means authority or character. This is the character of the beast right there, all that's in the world, isn't it? That's the character of Babylon, the mother of all idolatry, when they said, let us make us a name, isn't it? It's not even really hard. But boy, they've made it something complex. What I'm teaching is not real exciting to the average uh, layman or churchgoer because I don't have a bunch of bombs exploding. And a bunch of nuclear warheads and and uh, 
goofy helicopters. I've said before, I've said this many times, if the scorpions are helicopters, then when you're around Paul Crouch, keep your head down because he's got his blades going all the time. And you'll get your head cut off. That's what's so dumb about all this. Now let's go back. Do you see the signals? The signals and the beacons. And look at verse 5. And to them, to who? To the scorpions. It was given that they should not kill them that they but that they should be they will not be able to kill the ones who are sealed with God's seal in their foreheads the false teachers won't hurt us what does the scripture say in Matthew and Mark we're not to fear him who can destroy the body we're to fear him that can destroy both soul and body in hell he's showing you here and to them it was given that they should not kill the one sealed. They may kill us physically, but they're not going to kill us spiritually. If the rest of this is spiritual, the killing is spiritual, isn't it? But that they should be tormented five months. Now, I've heard these, quote, prophecy teachers say, see, these are helicopters, and they got stings in their tails, and those are machine guns, and they can't kill people, but they'll shoot them for five months. And then some guy's got all these holes in. You know. It's dumb, isn't it? What is five months? It's very interesting. Locusts come out once every seven years, supposed to be in America. That's probably the case it is. But the locusts of the Middle East and Africa have a lifespan of five months. That's their lifespan. He's not just talking about a five-month period. He's talking about during the time of their existence, during their life, whatever it is, this is a figurative, this is figurative showing you the lifespan of the literal locust. Their lifespan is five months, and all the time that they exist, they will be tormenting be tormented for five months. The word torment is the word basanizo, B-A-S-A-N, N-I-Z-O, B-A-S-A-N. Basanizo. It means to torture or to put in pain, to vex. These false teachers are vexing to me. They put me in pain. They are a torture. It comes from Basinos. Basinos is a... a touchstone. Does anybody here know what a touchstone is? Huh? A touchstone is a stone that's used on many precious stones to find out if it is genuine stone. In a sense, a diamond is a touchstone. When you rake it across, it will cut glass. It'll tell you that glass is not the real thing. 
it will reveal. You take a touchstone and you can scrape something and see if under it, if there's gold inside of it. It'll tell you by certain reactions if it's real. The scorpions are a touchstone to see if we are the real thing. Now, where do scorpions sting when they sting? Usually. That's exactly it. On the foot. That's where the scorpions love dark places. They love darkness. What's amazing, I've got several books on scorpions, and I've got children's books on scorpions, and it's it's amazing. <clears throat> Some of the writers tell us and some of the scientists tell us that scorpions, well, scorpions are, they keep men in darkness, don't they? They are worshipers of darkness. What is it that Paul says? He says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, against principalities. This is in the sixth chapter of Ephesians. Against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness. In the first chapter of Genesis, the moon was set to rule the night, wasn't it? So we wrestle against moon worshipers. Who were the moon worshipers? The Babylonians. The Babylonians were the ones who created the demons, and they were actually God-men who distributed fortunes. They were the men like Hercules and Orion and Venus and Jupiter of the ancient world. That was the sun worshipers. The Babylonians worshipped the Zodiac. And the Babylonians scattered Israel, didn't they? They were the literal scorpions that took Israel and scattered them all over the face of the earth. So scorpions, they rule in the darkness. They keep men in darkness. They shine in darkness. The only thing that can shine in darkness is the moon. And the Babylonians worship the moon. One of the writers says that out in a desert, you can go out into West Texas or Arizona, And that those scorpions out there, when they go out to hunt, they hunt at night. They love the darkness. And this one scientist said they plot the course that they take in night by the stars. Literally. A scorpion will get his bearing, know where he's going, and he will go and sit in a dark place. The scorpions are carnivores. A scorpion loves to eat another scorpion as much as he does anything else. And what is what is what is a carnivore? It is a flesh eater. Who are the most common flesh eaters that we can think of? Huh? Huh? Roman Catholicism. Roman Catholicism. And of course, like Denise said, Kahan, Baal, the priests of Baal, priests this word Kahan, and they ate human flesh from their altars, and that was implemented into the Roman Catholic Church because. Israel got this from the Babylonian system and that was the predecessor of Roman Catholicism when the Roman Empire was outlawed. They implemented all of this into Roman Catholicism. So scorpions are flesh eaters, aren't they? Now, five months. What else is five months? That's the judgment of God upon the earth in Genesis. Over in Genesis, when Noah 
is in the ark. If I can find it here. Noah's in the ark. Verse 24 of chapter 7. And the waters prevailed upon the earth and hundred and fifty days. How many days are in a Jewish year? 360. How many days in every Jewish month? 30. 30 days times five months is how much? 150 days. The judgment of God was upon the earth. So when you see five months over here, this, all of this has meaning to all this. Let's go back over here. Let's go back to Revelation 9. Can you see the... When, when the Bible says... When the Bible says that God would send the angel to John and that he sent and signified or he gave signs to John by the angel of all things that would happen. This is a picture, this fifth angel sounding the trumpet. The trumpet sounds, but this is not just a future event. How long have the scorpions been teaching? Since the garden, hadn't they? Who was the first scorpion? The serpent in the garden. Who is the first beast? The beast in the garden. That's where the mark of the beast began. You even have the sword, the famine, the pestilence, and the beast in the garden. The beast is the serpent. The famine, they are not going to be allowed to eat of the tree, and God's going to cause the ground, the ground to bring up thorns and briars. Man will have to earn his living by the sweat of his brow. That's famine. Pestilence is plague and death. What was the plague and death? Eating of the mark of the beast. Wasn't it? Does this make sense to everybody? It's what it is. And the sword, was there a sword in the garden? God put a cherubim with the sword in the garden, lest they should go back in and eat of the tree of life and live forever. And that was the judgment of God on Adam and Eve was the sword, the famine, the pestilence, and the beast in the garden in the third chapter of Genesis. Five months, and their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. Well, where does he strike a man? In the foot. And this word bassinizo, the word torture, pain, it comes from the word basis. Basis means the foot. The base of a man is his foot. There's a word for how we ought to walk in the New Testament. S-T-O-I-C-H-E-I-O. That means, that comes from stoichion. Stoichion means an orderly arrangement. When we walk according to the orderly arrangement of God, we are not affected by the stings of the scorpions. Now, when a man gets stung, oh, one scientist, Johnny Gladden used to come here. He was a, he was a, a majoring in chemistry out at Tennessee State University. And Johnny brought me a book by one of the scientists out there. He said, when a scorpion stings, it destroys the red blood cells. When a false teacher stings, he destroys the blood baptism, the red baptism. He stops men from dying to self, doesn't he? All of this is flags and signals. Can, can we say that? Now, let, let's go on a little further. Let's go on a little further. Hold on here. Let me flip back in this other Bible. All right. 
All right, here. Now, and in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it and shall desire to die and death shall flee from them. I've wrestled with this a long time. At first, I thought it was, this was talking about evil men. I don't believe evil men seek to die. I don't believe they ever want to die. I believe that believers want to die, and we keep living and keep living, don't we? Paul said, I have a desire to depart and be with Christ. The only people who really desire death is not evil men. You can find the most evil man in the world. And he can be so brazen and so arrogant and curse the warden and curse the jury as they find him guilty and sentence him to the electric chair. But when it times comes time to walk that last mile, he don't want to die and he turns into a little baby, weeping and crying. I don't believe this is talking about that. I believe it's talking about us. We seek death, and we don't find it until the Lord is ready to take us out of here. And look at verse 7. And the shapes of the locust were likened to horses prepared unto battle. When you see horses going into battle in that day and time, they had all kinds of armor on. And some of the locusts, and this one looks like he has the same thing. It looks like a horse prepared for battle. And some of them had a longer snout, and they had a shape of a horse's head upon it. So he's talking about, he's talking about these, and he's going to tell you what they are here shortly. Let me show you this. And on their heads were, as it were, crowns like gold. They weren't crowns of gold. Now, these are false teachers. They're coming out to battle us. We're in a battle with these people. We wrestle with these people. We put on the whole armor of God to battle the false teachers, and we wield the sword, which is the word of God. That's the battle we're in. Some of the uh, writers have said that when they, these locusts came in these hundreds of millions, it was that sound like a helicopter. It was like horses running into battle. He's giving the same idea of what this is like. Then he says, he tells you who they are in verse 7, the last phrase. And their faces were as the faces of men. He's telling you what they are in this verse. Here's who they are. They are men. And they had hair as the hair of women. I'm still wrestling with that. I'll come back to that. But I like this next phrase. And their teeth were as the teeth of lions. That is not mysterious at all. What did David call evil men? Look at Psalms 58. Psalms 58. Psalms 58. The only thing the hair of women may be, the women cut their hair and they trusted in their dowry which they had in their hair. That women's hair was cut in an adorned cut and they trusted in their dowry because they couldn't trust in the man they were married to because of, I mean, in Jewish law, the Jew could come in and he could say, I divorce you, get out. 
and she would have to leave immediately, and all she could carry with her was the dowry on her head. All the Jewish women wore their dowry in their hair because of that Jewish cultural law. Very well could be that he's saying here that scorpions trust in their own dowry, in their own money, like the woman had to do among the Jewish family. <clears throat> Look over here in Psalms 58. They, their teeth was as the teeth of lions. Psalm 58. Psalm 58 and verse, he's talking about evil men. Look at verse 3. Look at verse 3. Let me flip over in my other Bible. I'll show you some things here. Can you see the, the essence of the flags and the beacons and the signals? 58. Okay, hold on here. All right. Look at the wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born speaking lies. Their poison is like the poison of the serpent. They're, he's talking about the wicked. The wicked would be false teachers, wouldn't it? Any man living a lie is a false teacher by the way he lives. They are like the deaf adder that stoppeth her ear, which will not hearken to the voice of charmers, charming never so wisely. Break their teeth, O God, in their mouth. Break out the great teeth of the young lions, O Lord. The scorpions have the teeth of lions. A young lion was much more fierce than an old lion. They're full of vim, they're full of vigor, and they'll take on anything. They're just brazen. He sang, these evil men are like young lions. Look at Psalm 17. Psalm 17. How much time do I have? I need more. Psalm 17. <clears throat> David is saying, verse 8, Keep me as the apple of thine eye. Hide me under the shadow of thy wings from the wicked that oppress me from my deadly enemies who compass me about. They're enclosed in their own fat with their mouth. They speak proudly. They have now compassed us in our steps. They have set their eyes bowing down to the earth like as a lion that is greedy of his prey. And as it were a young lion lurking in secret places, David all through the Psalms equates evil men, false teachers as lions and young lions. Now you're going to find this same equation in these, in verses, uh, let me give you some of the verses. Psalms 3 and 7, Psalms 124 and 6, Proverbs 30, 14, uh, Joel 1 and 6, Psalms 57 and verse 4. My soul is among lions in verse 4. Just look over at verse 4 is among lions, and I lie even among them that are set on fire, even the sons of men whose teeth are spears and arrows and their tongue a sharp sword. He compares evil men as lions. Job 4 and 10, Daniel 7, 5, 7, and 8. All through here, Psalms 104, 21, Isaiah 5, 29, Jeremiah 2, 15. Evil men are lions. Go back over to Revelation. Here's what's amazing, verse 9. And they had breastplates, as it were, breastplates of iron. In the locust kingdom... 
You can tell what family a locust belongs to by its breastplate. That's what the scientists or the biologists, zoologists tell us. You can find, you can tell by the breastplate what it is, how it's shaped. Here you can tell who. Aren't these scorpions carnivores? Isn't Roman Catholicism a Babylonian system? Aren't they carnivores eating human flesh? You remember the four... The beast comes in four representations. The lion, the bear, the leopard. And the fourth one that overthrows all the others is made of iron. And that's the Roman system overthrowing Persia, Greece, Babylon. Remember, remember in Daniel, the second chapter, Nebuchadnezzar's dream, and he sees the head of gold, and Daniel says, that's you, Nebuchadnezzar, that's Babylon, it's more regal than the others, and the breast of of silver, and that's Persia, and the further you go down, the metals become less precious but stronger. And the torso of brass, that was Greece, and the legs of iron, that's Rome. You can, and we're not just talking about Roman Catholicism. We're talking about a Babylonian system. So when he says, and they had breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running into battle. And that's the sound that the locust actually made. It had a big blurring, buzzing sound. It's like, just multiply that billions of times over. And it's like horses running into battle. That's what little locusts did. But the spiritual locusts, they have this sound coming from the pulpits as they go out to destroy the people of God. And they had tails like in the scorpions. And there were stings in their tails. And their power was to hurt men five months. There you are back to the five months. Stings in their tails don't mean machine guns. <laughs> Stupid. When a scorpion attacks, where is his tail? Right there. It's not back here in the back. It's not a helicopter with machine guns back there. His tail is right here. It comes up over his head and it's right there. When he attacks, he's, he hits you with the tail right there. And when the stings are in their tail, what happens when a scorpion stings you? Numb. No feeling. And remember the winds of doctrine, what they do to people? In Ephesians, the fourth chapter, the winds of doctrine make the church past feeling. They are, the word is apageo, A-P-A-L-G-E-O, and it means apathetic. That's the numbness that we suffer from the stings of the false teachers. That's what's wrong with America. They've been stung by the scorpions. And when a man is numb, he's drunk, and he'll stagger around, and where will we sit? Anywhere. Where will we lay down? On anything. On any old doctrine. Just go and sit down in any church. Go and lay down on any doctrine anywhere. And he don't care. And he just, yeah, okay, preacher. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, yeah, amen. Let's go home. Yeah, I did my duty. And he doesn't care. And his conscience is seared as with a hot iron. <clears throat> I don't think I've ever taught this this slow. I haven't gotten into everything I wanted to about it. 
There's no doubt what the scorpions are. But they are a signal, a beacon. This is a beacon picture. And if you'll notice the next verse. And these scorpions had a king over them. These are not evil spirits out of some pit in the ground. Demons coming about with smoke around them. This is not helicopters with smoke after some nuclear warhead went off. These are false teachers that are proud. They're consumed by smoke. They're blocking the light like the locusts did. But their stings won't hurt us. But their whole lifetime, they will hurt those people who do not have God's law in their minds. The mark of Christ sealed with God's mark. And here's their king. Here's the king of the false teachers. And they had a king over them which is the angel of the place of no knowledge, the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Creek tongue it is Apollyon. From Apollyon we get the word Apollumi. A-P-O-L-L-U-M-E. That is the word lost, or perish. Perish. When the Bible says the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost, that which was Apollo me. And not he's not willing that any of us should perish. Their king is Satan. And Apollyon was one of the terms for the old serpent god of the ancient world. And that is that beast from the garden that was more subtle than any other beast of the field. Well, ain't that something? That's what the, that's what I hope. I meant to get back to Revelation 21. I wanted to really take time to go back through Revelation 9. I didn't exhaust it. There's so much more to this chapter, these scorpions here. If you get into running all your references on everything. But this is a picture of what the true scorpions are. Remember, scorpions and locusts, one is the literal, the other is the spiritual. One draws the, destroys the literal bread, the other destroys the spiritual bread. Well, let's pray. Father, thank you for truth. Cause us to continue this work. Forgive us where we fail. God, give Mary and me strength to keep going. Sometimes we get tired and weary. But Lord, we know you'll cause us to continue as long as you desire. Help the sheep here. Give them strength and courage to stand in these truths. God will give you the praise for everything in Jesus' name. Amen.